Margaret Crone with the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. Welcome to the webinar this morning on how USDA risk management tools can help diversified producers, particularly the Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program. This webinar is presented by Michael Fields Agricultural Institute and Midwest Organic and Sustainable Education Services, MOSES. The webinar is conducted with financial support from USDA's Risk Management Agency, but also just tremendous uh, technical assistance. So we are just indebted to Amanda Beck with Risk Management Agency's St. Paul office who's reviewed this and is also standing by so that during our Q&A, if we've got questions that uh, are very able presenters can't answer or want help with, she's right there to help. So we have today uh, really excellent presenters, Roxanne Brixen, who has done a lot of ins uh, crop insurance work for various agencies and is with the Great American Insurance Group. She has uh, tremendous uh, experience and is among the first couple of uh, uh, crop insurance leaders in the state of Wisconsin to get contracts on, on whole farm revenue protection. So she's uh, one of our two presenters, James Robinson, who is the research and policy associate at Rural Advancement Foundation International in North Carolina, is our other. Uh, the two co-hosts that I want to point out myself uh, and Harriet Bihar, Senior Organic Specialist at Moses. Harriet is going to do the question and answers later on. So as you have questions through this, please go down to the chat box. You'll see it on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, press chat and uh, you, you'll see the little plus sign there on the left <clears throat> of the word chat. Click that and start typing in questions as you have them. We will answer them at the end. Harriet will monitor that process. I want just to point out to you that we have an evaluation that we will send to everybody who has come uh, to this webinar and then we will also uh, ask your forbearance. We want to make sure this webinar is as helpful as it can be and we want your feedback. So for a select number of you, we will follow up and ask uh, for the opportunity to have a very short telephone conversation with a few of you. That will happen later on after we've had um, It'll probably be in April because the sign-up deadline for the Upper Midwest is March 15th. So we'll wait a little while, see if, in fact, we have people who haven't, have used the webinar to sign up and they will just help us. Um, so with uh, no further ado, let's get started. And uh, James Robinson, how about you jump right in? Great. Uh, well, thanks, Margaret, and uh, thanks, Harriet, for hosting this, and uh, to everybody else that has put in a lot of work uh, to make this happen. It's a pleasure to uh, chat a little bit this morning uh, with everyone about whole farm revenue protection. It's it's uh, a subject that I find really very interesting, as strange as that may sound. Um, so let's uh, let's dive into it. Um, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about crop insurance. We're going to do a little bit of a crop insurance 101 so that we're all on the same page and uh, make sure that, that we all uh, have the same sort of base level of knowledge that we need to, to understand whole farm revenue protection. Um, and we're going to talk about the different types of crop insurance, uh, both whole farm revenue protection and the other programs that uh, are available for, uh, for farmers that are seeking um, an insurance product to uh, help manage risk. Um, and then finally, we're going to uh, get into some of the uh, real nitty-gritty details of whole farm revenue protection, and, and uh, Roxanne is going to take that section and uh, I think provide some really great information about the applications process and the claims process, uh, things like um, the cost of, of whole farm revenue protection, we get a little bit of a sense of, of, of what that might be for a farm. Uh, get a sense of, of what kind of coverage is available under whole farm revenue protection. So whether you're uh, an insurance agent or a farmer, I think you're going to find that uh, that last section really very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so crop insurance 101. I, I start off with a 101 when I talk about this with, with farmers and with agents, which I do fairly frequently. Um, and, and typically, uh, especially when I'm in a room with farmers that are, are uh, highly diversified, 
Um, I ask if, if any of those farmers have ever had insurance before um, or if they currently have insurance. Um, and, and what I find in general is that farmers who uh, are, are highly diversified, who are growing um, you know, more than the, the typical two or three uh, crop rotation, uh, have not had insurance or they only have insurance for uh, a major cash crop. And, uh, and, and I also ask these farmers, well, what comes to mind when you, when you think of insurance as a farmer who hasn't had it in the past? And I, I often hear responses like, well, insurance covers, uh, covers corn and soybeans and some of the major uh, Midwestern crops. And, uh, and while that has, is true um, and, and has historically been true, uh, there are some new options for farms that are diversified. They're not growing some of those major commodities, but are growing more specialty crops for high value markets. And, uh, and whole farm revenue protection uh, fits right into that category of, of new programs that are covering some, uh, some of those crops that have historically been underserved by uh, crop insurance programs. Uh, there are two reasons why I think this is important. Uh, the first is obvious. The first is that uh, every farm really deserves a, a safety net. Um, if USDA is, is going to provide a, a safety net for, for one set of crops, they really should do so for another. And, and to USDA's credit and, and um, those in Congress who have worked on this, uh, to their credit, we're really moving in that direction. Uh, we're, we're, we're expanding the, the safety net so that uh, everyone who uh, labors in agriculture, everyone who farms, uh, has that safety net available to them. Um, the second reason uh, that whole farm revenue protection is, is important and, and insurance is important in general is that it helps you collateralize your debt uh, as a farmer. Um, it, it means that putting uh, your farm on, uh, uh, on the bank note, essentially putting your, your house or your land uh, up as collateral uh, becomes less necessary if you have crop insurance. And, and so it can uh, help protect you in a situation where you have to go to a lender in order to uh, finance your, your operation for a particular season or finance an expansion. Uh, next slide. Okay, so crop insurance 101. Uh, again, uh, we're, we're, we're still in, in this uh, initial explanation of how crop insurance works and why it may be important. Um, so for the sake of simple math, let's, let's look at an example of how it might, uh, might work with uh, $1,000 of revenue uh, for a farm. So this farm that has $1,000 of revenue, uh, we decide that we want to buy an 85% coverage policy. Well, to figure out how much of your, uh, your revenue is insured, uh, we'll really simply um, just multiply uh, that $1,000 of revenue by the 85% coverage and get $850. And so that's, that's the amount of revenue that you have covered. Uh, let's assume that hail hits a week before the harvest, it wipes out 50% of your crop and it leaves you with uh, $500 in revenue for the year. Um, so let's take a look at what that may do. Um, you've got $1,000 in expected revenue, as we said, and you bought um, $850 uh, worth of coverage for that farm. You had $500 in actual revenue, so you are gonna get an indemnity payment of $350. That's how insurance works in a year where you have a loss. Uh, let's uh, look at another example, really simple math again, of, of how this may work in a different situation. So we've got the same $1,000 expected, the same 85% coverage, so $850 of it is insured. You have minor flooding in a single field that brings your crop down, or your, your revenue down to $900 uh, in 2015. And let's see how that plays out. Well, we didn't get down to that uh, $850 uh, sort of trigger point. So in this case, there's not going to be an indemnity that's paid. You can think of this a little bit like paying for car insurance uh, in any given year and not having an accident and so you don't have to file a claim. Really, that's the way we want it to work. We want that little bit of security, but we don't want to have to use it. Um, and so in this, this case, we had a little bit of security but didn't have to use it. Okay, so what kind of of policies are available. We've, we've, I've mentioned whole farm revenue protection, but I've also mentioned that other policies are available. Uh, first, um, we can talk about multi peril uh, crop insurance policies or an MPCI policy. Um, these are available only for certain crops uh, and they vary state by state. They can vary, I think, down to the county level. Um, they can cover your, your revenue history um, and your production history, um, and the coverage level can be up to 85%. This is a pretty good deal if you're growing 
one or two crops, and those one or two crops have an MPCI policy available. So, for example, in North Carolina, where I'm located, uh, apples would be an example of, of a, a, a crop that is covered by a single crop policy. So what else is available? Um, through the uh, non-insured crop disaster assistance program, you can get coverage. This is not technically crop insurance. It's a farm service agency program rather than a risk management agency program. Uh, but this is a pretty good deal if you grow a crop that is not covered by a multi peril crop insurance policy, hence the name. Uh, it's a non-insured crop disaster assistance program. Um, you can get up to 65% coverage. Farmers may remember that in the past, that covered payment rate, um, I guess not technically a payment rate, but it was, uh, you were covered at 50% um, of your crop at 55% of the price. And so it was about 27.5% coverage after you do the math, which uh, requires a significant loss before you ever get a payment. And, and farmers uh, did things like call it not a penny um, <laughs> insurance, and, and it wasn't really far from the truth. You had to have a significant loss before you had a payment. Um, so uh, for farmers who recognize uh, this as that old program, um, you, can, you can think of it as a, a little bit of an updated program now because we've got the 65% coverage level. Um, also, if you're a beginning farmer, limited resource farmer, um, or historically underserved, uh, socially disadvantaged farmer, then uh, you do have administrative fees waived for the program, which brings down the cost. So it, it could be an interesting option for you. Um, and finally, whole farm revenue protection. Um, let's move right into this, since this is the, the main subject of the webinar. Um, this is one of the best deals if you have records. Um, we'll talk a little bit more, Roxanne especially, we'll talk a little bit more about what those records have to be and, and over how much time. But uh, this will cover all of the revenue of the farm, uh, no matter the crop or the price point. Uh, it will cover up to a million dollars in livestock revenue. You can get up to 85% coverage uh, for diverse farms. And we'll talk a little bit more about what diverse farms means, how we define that. And then you can get 80% uh, uh, subsidy on premiums, uh, again, on, uh, if your farm uh, meets certain diversification uh, criteria. Next, next slide, please. So why would someone want whole farm revenue protection? Um, it, is, it is a multi-peril um, type of, of coverage, but we, we said that there are other multi-peril policies, right? Um, and those other multi-peril policies are a, a great tool if uh, you grow crops that are covered uh, by those uh, multi-peril policies. Um, again, NAP, also a great tool if you have a crop that's not covered by one of those multi-peril policies. Um, but whole farm revenue protection does some, some things that are unique um, and, and may be reasons uh, to look closer at this program. One is that it covers all of your revenue, no matter the crop or the price point. So if you're growing organic crops at a higher price point, if you're selling uh, direct market and you're getting a premium price in the market for that uh, direct market product, uh, whole farm revenue protection will cover that higher value, uh, which can be uh, really a, a valuable thing for farms. Um, it's available everywhere in the U.S. Uh, this is actually the first crop insurance program ever available uh, in every state and every county in the country. So no matter where you grow, uh, you can access this program. Uh, it uses um, the uh, tax records that you already have. So uh, as a farm that is, is keeping records for tax purposes, you shouldn't have to do anything new uh, in order to, to access the program. And the federal insurance subsidy may be larger for this program if your commodity count, uh, which is a part of the measure of the diversification, is uh, uh, higher um, than uh, three crops. So uh, for all of those reasons, whole farm revenue protection becomes a really uh, interesting product to look at. So uh, who can benefit from this? Who is this sort of created for? And uh, the short answer really is, is everyone. Um, there, there's really um, uh, very few farms out there that, that this program wouldn't serve well. But uh, specifically, uh, it can be a real benefit to diversified farms. Uh, if you're growing seven or eight different crops and you don't want to have to cover each of those under a single crop policy, a single crop MPCI policy, or those policies don't exist, then whole farm revenue protection with one policy will cover all of those crops. Uh, it can benefit organic farms because, again, of that higher price point uh, in the marketplace, the direct marketer because of that higher price point, 
uh, specialty crop farms who often don't have an MPCI policy for the specialty crop that they grow, um, and the wholesaler as well. So really many, many farms are going to fit into a category of, of farms that would be served well by this product. Um, so what revenue does whole farm revenue protection cover? Um, let's see. Uh, it actually covers the lower of this year's expected revenue for your farm or your uh, historic revenue, which is averaged over uh, uh, about five years. Um, at the selected coverage level for all commodities produced on the farm, um, that includes up to a million dollars in livestock, as we said, up to a million dollars in nursery products, and then um, commodities purchased for resale, up to 50% uh, of your total farm's revenue, uh, and then also possible replant uh, costs. Next slide, please. Uh, so what does whole farm revenue protection not cover? Uh, it doesn't cover animals for sport, show, or pet, uh, or pets. Uh, it doesn't cover timber uh, or uh, forest products. Um, so these are all things that uh, are, are not going to be covered by uh, crop insurance in general, but whole farm revenue protection is not going to cover those. Uh, what types of losses are not covered? Um, this is an important thing to think about uh, because whole farm revenue protection covers uh, both um, uh, losses in yield, uh, but also price. So let's talk about what kind of yield losses and price losses would not be covered under this. For price, um, if you if you had a drop in price as a result of quarantine, uh, boycott, um, deterioration in commodity storage, these things are not going to be covered. With yield, if the yield loss is due to negligence, uh, mismanagement, or wrongdoing, um, if it's an act of person rather than nature, theft, vandalism, these things are not covered. Uh, the important way to think about this is whether or not the loss is a result of a natural cause. Um, if there was human intervention that resulted in the loss, uh, then that's probably not going to be covered. But if it was a natural cause, um, in, in the crop insurance world people like to say an act of God, um, if it was something out of your control that resulted in the loss of your crops, then, then it would likely be covered. Uh, but that would have to be determined with uh, an adjuster um, during the claims process. Next slide. Okay, relevant whole farm revenue protection dates. Uh, these are in Wisconsin. Um, the sales date, uh, sales closing date is March 15th. Um, then you've got a bunch of reports and things that are due. Uh, after that, um, on March 15th, you've got the intended farm operations report. This is part of your application. And then you've got a revised farm operations report due in July. Uh, this is something that happens in the middle of the year to make sure that uh, what you put in your application and what is actually happening on your farm um, are, are similar. And if they're not, then there's some corrections that are made. Um, and then the final farm operations report is due uh, March 15th of the next year. And uh, then farms will file their taxes if you're a um, calendar year uh, tax filer. And then claims are worked out after taxes. Uh, because remember, this is based on your farm's revenue, and it's based on uh, your, that revenue is calculated based on your historic uh, Schedule F forms, uh, those tax forms. And so in order to file a claim, you've got to wait until uh, your taxes are filed this year and your actual revenue can be determined. Um, and it's important to note that um, lost notices are still due within uh, 70, 72 hours of a cause. So even though you can't file the claim until after your taxes uh, have been submitted, you do want to contact an adjuster uh, once you have a loss. Uh, there were some improvements made um, in 2016. Uh, we're going into the second year of this program now, and the first year showed us that we need to make a few improvements to the program, and, and RMA has made those improvements. Um, so we think we've got an even better product in, in 2016, better program. Um, one of those upgrades was that it became available in, in all 50 states. Um, there were five states that were excluded in 2015 and some counties uh, in California. Uh, fewer years of records are required for new farmers. So if you're a beginning farmer, you're going to be able to access this program two years earlier. It's going to be about five years uh, of history rather than seven. Um, or you, you should have to be going into your fifth year of farming rather than going, going into your seventh year of farming to access this if you're a beginning farmer. Um, if you're physically unable to farm uh, for uh, one year, 
there is some record keeping flexibility, meaning that you will be able to uh, take an average and uh, sort of create that missing year of records. Um, so say for example, if you were ill and were unable to farm or uh, if you were deployed, uh, if, you, if you're uh, in, in the service and were deployed and unable to farm for a year, you'll be able to keep um, uh, eligibility for this program by building that, uh, that missing year uh, in. And then uh, expanding operations are going to be allowed up to 35% uh, of their historic revenue, um, meaning you can expand up to 35%. So even if your uh, farm is growing and your historic revenue doesn't reflect what you'll be doing this year, you can, um, you can have additional coverage in the program up to 35% of what your historic revenue is, 35% increase. And then direct marketing sales now allow contemporaneous records. So if you don't have uh, your price data historically, you can develop that contemporaneously um, throughout the year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so let's take a look at whether or not this, this program has improved over um, adjusted gross revenue light. That was actually the, um, the prior whole farm policy that was available. And it was an underutilized program for a number of reasons. And uh, we think that whole farm revenue protection, especially the program that will be available in 2016, will, will be an improved program. Uh, but let's look at how to measure that. Um, one of the ways is to look at how much agricultural revenue is insured. Uh, the chart you see on your left, uh, in 2015, there was uh, a little over $1 billion in agricultural revenue insured by uh, WFRP. And uh, AGR and AGR Light policies combined over the previous four years uh, were about half of that. Uh, and the uh, chart you see on your right, in 2014, AGR and AGR Lite were uh, was sold uh, in combination 838 policies, and we increased that when WFRP became available in 2015 by 282 policies. Um, it's important to note that we also had uh, uh, a lot of new counties that became eligible for this program. So uh, the uh, area that you see there in red are the number of new policies that were sold, but in counties where AGR products were previously available. So what that's indicating to us is that even though we had uh, increased geographic availability of the program, uh, we saw the increase in policies sold in areas where AGR and AGR Lite were already available. So uh, it's probably a pretty good indication that producers met the program with greater approval uh, than they, they did AGR and AGR Lite. Uh, next slide. Okay, so there are a few other products I'm going to go over very, very quickly. Um, uh, one is, is the organic uh, crop uh, pricing. In 2014, the Farm Bill required RMA to release organic uh, price elections, and uh, currently there are 38 organic price elections, um, uh, and RMA is still working hard to, uh, to release additional price elections. This, this requires data, but essentially what this does for farmers is allow organic producers who, again, as I mentioned, are getting that higher price in the marketplace to sell at that or, or to uh, insure their crop at that organic price. Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, organic crops also have the contract price addendum available to them. Um, what is it? Uh, it's another uh, procedure insurance companies uh, follow to allow a certified organic uh, producer to insure their crops um, at, at a higher price. So if you have a contract, for a price that is higher than the established uh, conventional crop price, then you can insure at that as long as the price um, uh, is not above the cap that's put on the contract price addendum, which is one and a half times the conventional price. Um, so if you are selling uh, a crop as an organic producer under contract that is more than one and a half times the conventional price, uh, you will run into that cap. Um, and it is actually one of the places where whole farm revenue protection can be useful for you because uh, if you're selling it more than one and a half times the price, then whole farm revenue protection will, will cover the revenue uh, it, if you, as long as you keep the records of, of the uh, prices that you're getting. So next slide, please. 
Okay, with the, that uh, overview, I'm going to turn it over to Roxanne, who is going to get really into the, the details of this program. So thanks, everyone, and Roxanne, take it away. All right. <clears throat> um, we're going to compare a little bit um, through these slides about how it relates in, uh, compared to other MPCI products. So some of the dates and stuff I'll refer to, I'll make that comparison so you can see how it lines up or doesn't line up with other RMA crop insurance um, products. So first of all, let's talk about the whole farm insurance cycle, which is very similar to other multi apparel products out there. So the insurance cycle for, for whole farm is going to start again at application time. And again, for Wisconsin and neighboring states, that's going to be March 15th. And then on July 15th, for Wisconsin and neighboring states, again, we'll need to revise the report, the farm operations report, which is just like an acreage report for those of you that have carried other um, crop insurance products, to let us know that you did or did not actually do what you said you were going to do as far as your farming goes on March 15th. Um, then after the year's end, you're also going to need to give the insurance company a final revenue earned on the required forms and then file your year-end taxes. So with that, we'll go to the next slide where we have the application requirements. All these forms listed here, and don't let all those forms scare you, they're all due by 315 in Wisconsin and again the neighboring states. So there is an application for your whole farm revenue protection policy that will need to come in along with the initial farm operations report. I like to refer to the initial farm operations report as an intended acreage report because you're going to give us exactly what you think you're going to plant as far as commodities, how many acres you're going to plant each of those, what price you think you're going to be able to sell those for, um, and then give us your expected revenue right on there. You're also going to give us a whole farm revenue inventory if you have animals, livestock, um, or nursery out there so we can tell what your beginning and ending inventories are. We only are ensuring what um, your actual growth is in between there. So if you have products like um, higher value at the end of the year, it's the value in between whether that's actually covered under the whole farm. You'll also let us know your accounts receivables and payables reports. The reason for that is if you have sold something in a prior year but did not receive the income yet from it, it is still counted on that prior year. It's not going to be included in the year that you received the money in that case. Um, allowable revenue worksheets and allowable expenses worksheets will be due. And those um, all come from your five years of Schedule F. So the data is actually, actually is going to be easy to fill out uh, once you get those Schedule Fs. So requesting a whole farm revenue policy, you're going to fill out an application um, typically with the information you would, know, you would use for any sort of insurance policy on your crop. So you're going to give us your name, address, what type of entity, and the ID number that you actually farm under. So if you farm as a partnership, that's what you're going to turn in this policy as, as a partnership. You're going to have to note what kind of tax filer you are, if it's a fiscal year or calendar year filer, and this may alter some of the deadlines for certain aspects of your policy. You'll need to choose how high a coverage level you will need for your farm revenue. Now, you can go up to 85% coverage level in, some, in most situations, and that, of course, would then give you a lesser deductible at that point, the higher you go. If you have other federal crop insurance or FSA coverage, then you're going to need to report that also. It does give you a little bit of um, a aid when it comes to your premium. Any insurance payments that you get from those other programs are also going to come off any full farm payable loss um, during the current year. You also let us know, you need to let us know if you're a vertically integrated farmer and you do other type of post-production work on your farms possibly that make your commodities or, um, or other commodities worth more money, uh, those activities are not covered so we don't take their revenue or expenses into account. And we can go through that a little bit later in another slide. Okay, the next slide, when we talk about the eligibility requirements, um, you have to be a U.S. citizen. This is a government program. 
and tax dollars do go to pay for the subsidies, so therefore you have to be a U.S. citizen or a resident. You must schedule, you must file Schedule S with your taxes or other tax forms that can be converted to a Schedule F. And this next bullet point is pretty important. Your Schedule F must cover 100% of your operations. So when you file your taxes, if you are a partnership and farm as such, then your Schedule Fs must be filed as the partnership. If you have two brothers, uh, John and Joe, and they are partners in J&J Farms, if John does not want whole farm revenue protection, Joe cannot take out the policy in just his behalf. Or even if they file their taxes separately on the one partnership farm, they cannot take the whole farm revenue protection policy. So the farm has to also derive 50% or less of its revenue from any commodities that are purchased for resale. So that cannot be the majority of how they make their revenue on the farm. And you can insure revenue up to $8.5 million. So it has been expanded so that it can take on a very high dollar uh, farmer out there. Other requirements, um, James, I believe, mentioned these. You're going to have a million dollar limit in revenue on animal and animal products. So if you have a dairy and a um, small herd of beef cattle, your revenue from milk and steers cannot be more than a million dollars as of March 15, um, historically, or you cannot have that full farm policy that just um, shuts those farmers right out of this. Uh, same with the nursery. If you have a nursery and a greenhouse revenue that is greater than a million dollars um, in expected revenue, then you cannot have the whole farm revenue policy. Um, the potato growers, and there's a contract with them, you cannot have only potatoes and take the whole farm revenue policy. And you cannot have only one commodity that there is an NPCI policy for. You can also not take a cap policy for any commodity and have the whole farm um, policy. You can, however, use another person's tax records if you purchase, inherit, or lease an operation. So that's good news for somebody who's just taking over a farm. And then uh, a couple other small uh, bullet points there. You can't have a short tax year. So if you're converting from calendar to fiscal year filer and your tax year is only going to be 10 months long, you cannot take the whole farm revenue policy. And if you are a, uh, an entity that's considered a cash-through entity for revenue, you also cannot uh, take the whole farm revenue product. So for required documentation, you're going to have to have your five consecutive years of tax records that we talked about earlier, your Schedule S. Those tax records um, for five years need to come in. Uh, and as James mentioned, if you're a beginner farmer, then you're only going to have to send in three years of those records, and there's just some calculations we can do to fill in the other two years for you. Allowable revenues and allowable expenses for all years. Now, we have the revenue and expense worksheet. You'll fill out a separate one for each year, which means you're going to have five separate revenue worksheets and five separate expenses worksheets. Those numbers typically just flow right over from your Schedule F so it's almost like copying those down on the form. And then as far as the whole farm history report, you're just going to take your totals from those revenue and expense worksheets and put them onto one worksheet, which is the whole farm history report, so that you can see your five-year average in one place. Inventory reports need to come in if you have the livestock nursery um, operation. And then your farm operations report to give us your intended planted acres, um, and then your intended um, prices that you think you'll be selling those for. So that's going to be your plan for that year. We're going to take that information that you give us on those forms to determine your allowable revenue. And it's going to be the revenue from the production of commodities produced on the farm or purchased for further growth. So that's going to include sales of animals or commodities that are purchased for resale. And again, I talked earlier about we're only going to ensure the amount of growth for the year. So you're going to remove your cost out of that um, or other basis or what it may have been worth at the beginning of the year. Um, sales of animals and produce that you raise. Um, if you have taxable co-op distribution, those are also included in your revenue. 
and then any other revenue related to the production of commodities. Um, there is a difference between uh, post-production activities and market readiness operations. Uh, market readiness operations have some expenses possibly in or near the field. Uh, for instance, maybe if you raise lettuce, your heads of lettuce need to be washed as they get um, boxed right there near the field, and that's how they get transported off the field. Those don't raise the price or the revenue that you expect from those heads of lettuce. They are simply the minimum required to make it market ready. So those expenses are already included in there, and, and the revenue doesn't really go up on those. So the allowable revenue does not include um, post-production operations, which I mentioned earlier. Post-production operations, if you have, let's just say, an apple and pear orchard, and uh, at the end of the year you take some of those apples and pears and you start putting them in baskets with bows on them and set them up as if they would be good gift baskets, you're actually including another maybe $2 in cost into each one of those, and you're receiving an extra $6 in revenue from that, you do not get covered for that extra revenue because that's not considered your um, initial raising and selling of the, of the product itself. Um, the other stuff that's not covered, if you go through this list, <coughs> um, you do not include um, any wages or custom hire activities. Those do not um, add to your approved revenue because they don't have anything to do with raising and selling a commodity from your farm. So you also do not include any income from government programs like CRP. You don't add in any past crop insurance payments from the years that you're getting your historical average from, nor is any additional value added to the crop um, by you as a post-production activity. That's also not included. Uh, so those those things there on that list do not include it to raise your revenue at all. On the next slide, um, we'll go through expenses a little bit. Um, on the expense side of things, you don't really use the expenses um, on the onset of your policy, but they are used at claim time. So your expenses, if you look here, even though you need to turn them in, they don't come off of your policy initially. You can sort of look at it like we're ensuring your gross revenue. Um, so your expenses need to be turned in, but again, they're not used up front. If we go to the next slide, uh, James mentioned that we cover the lower of the whole farm historic average revenue. You can go to the next slide. Uh, the whole farm historic average revenue, that includes any indexing or farm expansion. Indexing is a way to raise your coverage a little bit if you actually have um, years, more recent years, that actually are better than some past years. The farm expansion, uh, James mentioned, you can um, cover up to 35% more. If by chance you are picking up more acreage, maybe going to farm some acreage more intensely, or maybe you're adding some high dollar crops to the acres that you already have, and that's going to increase your revenue. So for farm expansion, you can um, you can go ahead and, um, on the farm expansion, you can go ahead and, and report that stuff and then we'll insure you for more. Um, or it's the lower of your total expected revenue. Now the reason that they're only going to insure the lower of is because your total expected revenue could go down for the year if by chance you've lost some of the acres that you're farming or some crops you're not going to farm this year that were um, adding a lot of revenue for you. So, um, so if you're going to get less money in this year, then we're only going to cover you for that amount versus your five-year historical average. Can you move to the next slide? Okay, and then go one more slide. Okay, now the next subject I want to cover is the commodity count. With the commodity count, your subsidy can increase and your premium decrease at the same time the more commodities that you actually farm. So 
school, the more diverse you are, the less risk you actually have out there for losing a lot of money. So therefore, they charge you less premium. And because diversifying also causes less risk out there, you're also going to increase your subsidy. So you can see from this chart that your higher subsidy percentage comes with two or more commodities at the 50 to 75% coverage level. Now, if you choose to insure at the higher coverage level, like 80 and 85%, you can see that the subsidy drops a little bit. And the reason for that is because the higher up in coverage you go, the greater the risk that you will get some sort of lost payment. So therefore, they've reduced that a little bit. So what kind of cost am I looking at? We set up a couple of examples here so you can kind of get an idea. We just use random counties, so this would be different for where you're located, and which crops you're actually raising have different risks too. So between the county and the um, actual crops and how much of each crop you're raising, that will actually change these dollars, um, but this will give you a little bit of a general idea. So let's just say you're a fresh market seller of a dozen different vegetables. Five of those vegetables earn you more revenue than the other seven uh, combined. So we're going to use all five of those more substantial commodities. The other seven, because they're smaller, we add them together and they still qualify for a separate commodity. So that gives you a diversity of six crops. With those six crops, your farm is expected to gain revenue of $100,000. At the 75% coverage level, you're going to have $75,000 in coverage. And for premium, you're going to pay less than $900 for that kind of coverage after the subsidy is paid by the government. Now on the next example, in the next slide, uh, you farm corn and soybeans conventionally, um, so just normal crop. Cover them under multi peril but you also have some acres that you put into two different high dollar crops. So you have a diversity of four different crops. You Take a multi-parallel policy, which is going to give you a bit of a benefit on the premium side. Now, if you look at your, at the 85% coverage level, you still have $102,000 worth of coverage because under the whole farm revenue, they're still basing that off your expected revenue of $120,000. They don't take off your multi-parallel insurance on the onset of your policy. Instead, at claim time, if you get a claim payment for your multi peril policy, we're going to subtract, subtract that from your whole farm policy prior to that payment being made. So that is how the additional policy affects uh, your insurance for whole farm. In the third example, um, we've added some livestock in there so you can see how that works and then get an idea of the price. Uh, you have half a million dollars in cow-calf livestock, another 300000 in feeder pig revenue, and then you have some revenue in corn and some in soybeans. You also raise um, corn for feed, so therefore you have some that does not have any revenue. So when you have to complete an inventory report to tell us what you have on your farm, you're going to let us know that you have commodities for feed and they'll be valued at zero dollars, both at the beginning and the end of the policy. They really are expenses because your revenue is actually up in the livestock. In this policy, you can have a policy, you can have a policy because you have less than a million dollars in livestock. And when I ran a quote and I just uh, ran it for Southern Wisconsin, um, at the 70% level, you have over a million dollars in coverage for about $10,000 in premium. That's about a 1% charge for the, for the dollars that you're insuring. If you ran that up to 80%, you had $1.2 million in coverage, and it was going to cost $26,000. You're still only paying a little over 2% of your um, indemnity, or possible indemnity dollars uh, in premium. So that'll just give you an idea for cost. Now, if you're going to look up your costs yourself, you don't really need to have all the details of all five years of your, of your history. Um, but you can do sort of a general um, look up to see approximately what your cost would be. 
Uh, you can do that by seeking out a crop insurance agent, or you can go straight to AMA's website, and we'll put a link down there on the PowerPoint for you. If you go to that link, um, on the next slide, you will see the screen where we fill out the information. So you'll put key in that criteria in the upper part of the box there. You're going to select that you want a whole farm revenue protection for the 2016 crop year. You'll select the state and county, what kind of tax filer you are, and then down below, you'll give us an idea of what your allowable revenue is. So for the past five years, if you have a general idea of what your um, revenue has been, you just key those numbers in there. And then below that, you're going to have to add in all the commodities and how much of that value belongs to each one of those. So even though you don't get super technical to get a, um, you know, a very easy quote or a very you know, general idea of what your cost could be, you don't need to run through all those forms first. If premium is going to matter, um, just go ahead and give us roundabout figures in this program and any crop insurance agent can go ahead and look those up for you. And then all you need to do is click Get Estimate. So on the next slide, you're going to see the result of that. And if you look across the top, um, you have a choice there, and the one that has the bullet highlighted is Producer Premium Amount. So that's after the government has given you the subsidy, the amount of premium you see down here would be your cost, and it would be at all all those different coverage levels. And if you want to know what the liability, the amount of coverage you have at those coverage levels, you can go back to that first bullet point and just click liability amount. If you want to print off a worksheet to see where those figures came from, off to the right of that, you'll be able to see those, those bullet points. Okay, so on the next slide, after we get through all the application time, uh, we talked about having to revise your farm operations report, and this is going to happen on July 15th, by July 15th, for um, people in Wisconsin. <clears throat> now, revising the farm operations report is actually very easy. The farm operations report that you filled up just has a couple, couple of extra columns over to the side that basically you refill in any changes, so any acreage changes or price changes that you may need to put in there. Now let me just give you an example of revising uh, a farm operations report. If you intended to plant 100 acres of corn, but you couldn't do that um, due to it being too wet, so then you decided to still get soybeans in, you keep your intended acres of corn on this farm operations report with what your intended revenue was. But you also add what you actually planted, which is your soybeans. And the revenue from them that you're going to expect now is less than the corn. So you subtract it from the corn, but you still leave the balance of expected revenue on the corn. So your expected revenue does not go down because you turn in a revised farm operations report. I did want to point that out to you. Okay, if we go to the next slide, once we have that uh, revised operations report in, Nothing else is needed unless there's a claim. So as far as a notice of claim goes, if you've ever had a crop insurance policy before, you know that you have to report your claim within 72 hours of when your weather-related incident happened. So that still stays the same. If you come in under your revenue um, and you think you'll have a payable claim, um, maybe work more related to pricing, you can file your claim no later than 60 days after the original date your farm tax forms are due. So if you're a calendar year filer and those are due April 15th of the next year, you have 60 days after that uh, by which you have to turn in that claim. So required documentation for a claim, you'll see pretty much the same reports that you've seen at the beginning of the year because we need to know what the final numbers are before the insurance companies can go ahead and, and work your claim and decide whether or not you have a, a payable claim out there. So there's your list of reports. Again, your final farm operations report, your expenses and your revenues, your accounts receivables and inventory. That stuff is all due um, at that point. 
So then on the next slide for indemnity, they're going to determine your allowable revenue. They're going to take any ending inventories minus beginning inventory, same with your accounts receivable, uh, before they can figure out your indemnity. And just note that second bullet there, um, determine allowable expenses. If by chance you pay um, expenses to a greater extent than you would have in the past, or if loss of the insurance here prevents you from paying or prepaying for expenses and supplies to the extent you have in the past, there are adjustments that have to be made on the policy that will change your indemnity a little bit. So there are some alterations that need to be made, and those rules apply the same for everybody. Um, on the next slide for the indemnity, we talk about the expense reduction factor. Now, if you've ever carried a multi peril policy in the past, you know that if you do prevent payment, prevent plant payment on corn, uh, for not planting it out there because of the weather, then we're going to lower the payment. And the reason for that is that you don't have the cost of raising or harvesting that crop any longer or getting it to market. So because of the lesser expense, um, RMA has decided that um, prevent plant payments will pay out less. The same happens with this expense reduction factor, which is part of the whole farm policy. If your expenses get to be less than 70% of your normal approved expenses, then we start lowering, lowering your liability payment just a little bit at a time. But you have to be down more than 30% in expenses before we do that. Um, and then we also calculate revenue accounts. When we count the revenue that you did get from your commodities or your livestock, we also add in any insurance payments from other multi peril or FSA coverage. So that stuff gets added in as revenue to count before they can pay you uh, for your whole farm policy. We also add in any gains from commodity hedging. <clears throat> so then after they've done that, that is when they apply the expense reduction factor to your approved revenue. Um, so you're kind of going back to the beginning again. And then multiply by your coverage level. Uh, and then after that, we subtract the revenue to count. Um, and again, it gives a list of um, different revenues to count there that is, that is in the, the policy. Let's go ahead and look at the example on the next slide, um, how the expense reduction factor works. Um, from the top of the slide, you're looking at approved expenses of $100,000. But since some of his commodities drowned out early, he no longer had the rest of the cost of raising and harvesting his commodities. So since his expenses dropped so erratically, the government will begin to reduce his claim. If the expenses would have been normal, his claim would have paid $72,500. But they lowered his approved revenue by $2,600 using that 2% reduction factor in the chart. And then after applying the 75% coverage level, this left him with uh, $1,950 less in actual coverage. So it reduces the amount of actual coverage you have, which in essence reduces the amount of liability or claim payment you can get. <clears throat> so that's how the expense reduction factor work, works. In the next slide, um, there's a couple of slides for replant payments. Replant payments look very similar to how they work on a normal MPCI policy. Uh, it does have to be an annual plant. You can't have um, perennials out there and expect to be able to replant them. So this is only on annual plants. It has to be damaged uh, due to an insurable cause of loss or uh, like flooded out, that type of thing. You have to meet what we call the 2020 rule, so there's a minimum amount of acreage that we will uh, pay a replant payment on. And then we have to have verifiable records basically showing us what your actual cost of replanting is. So the amount of um, price that you pay for the extra seed and stuff will need to be turned into the company. Um, we'll probably go out there, inspect the field, release it for replant, and then go ahead and do the work to get you a replant payment. Um, out to you. Now, if you look at the next slide for replant payment, we do need to determine the actual cost of replant. You know, we cannot forward out a check for that. And if you have a multi-peril policy um, that covers a replant, 
on your commodity specifically, then we won't pay that under your whole farm policy because it's going to be paid under your other policy. So that gets us through the claim time. It kind of gives you a bit of an overview, um, if not a deep in the weeds type of look at the whole farm uh, product. So the next couple slides, I just want to hit on a couple of pros and cons. You know, what looks appealing on this product is that um, revenue from normally uninsurable crops is insurable. Um, you get to pay less premium the more diverse you are. If you are anywhere near high risk land in Wisconsin that's only going to be in, in Lafayette County, a normal crop insurance, you'd have to pay a much higher premium. You don't have to do that here. If you write um, insurance in different than Neuer, um, Iowa, they both have several counties with high risk. That doesn't matter on the whole farm policy. You can use prices that are significantly higher than what RMA assigns. Um, again, you do have to have um, a reason or a place where those prices do come from, whether it's contracts or local markets of some sort. And then you get possible higher government subsidies that you don't have um, quite that much on other NPCI policies. Um, on the negative side of things, any loss payment cannot be calculated until after tax time the next spring. So it's possible you'll be waiting a little bit longer for any kind of payment. And then uh, certain things under livestock, um, we do get several questions on that, uh, selling your cows, um, you know, reducing your herd or thinning your herd. Um, due to getting rid of the call cows out there is not an expected revenue, so it does not increase your um, historical revenue at all, and you have your limitations. Now, the other thing is a negative is if you don't purchase your whole farm revenue protection policy until after uh, the new year starts, which is now, you have to use the price you've already sold for. So if you're already selling on some of your cattle, you can't use an expected price. You're going to have to use what you've already sold for. The same would go if you're a dairy farmer and selling your milk out there. So then the other um, slide here that I'll finish with is how do you buy crop insurance? Um, out on RMA's website, uh, there is a list of crop insurance agents. Uh, so you can go ahead and look at um, ones that are near you. Uh, some, uh, all crop insurance agents are independent agents. They don't work for a, a company like I do and stuff, so um, we're not affiliated other than um, they use us as a company. So if you are looking for a little bit more aid, you can go to a crop insurance agent, um, or I believe maybe some of our contact information will be sent out to you guys if you have questions also on the whole farm product. With that, I'll let Harriet take it over, and she's going to go through any questions that she's received through the chat box. Okay, so there were, hello, everyone can hear me, I hope. Um, there were quite a few questions, and I believe there was one about how does Whole Farm Revenue Protection work with traditional crop policies. I think you did cover that pretty well, Roxanne, but maybe you could just um, go over that one more time. And also a related question was, what if you have signed up with the Farm Service Agency for uh, the ARC or other uh, programs which kind of act like crop insurance? Okay, as far as the other NPCI policies work, if you are covering your corn, soybeans, um, let's just say uh, onion, um, through MPCI policies, then you're still going to take the whole farm revenue policy. It's going to ensure the gross revenue, so you're not going to take that, those crops, that insurance amount uh, for your multi apparel out of your revenue to begin with. So you're still insuring the higher amount that you get from premium credit for having multi-parallel coverage because you are reducing your risk on the whole farm side. But at claim time, any insurance payment that you get from, from, from the, the corn or the soybeans or the onion policy will be counted as revenue account. Therefore, it will come off of your claim payment under whole farm. So that's how those ones relate. Um, as far as ARC and PLC, uh, those aren't specific 
Oh gosh, I'm, I'm unsure. I would think that those payments again would be worth as um, as revenue to count, but I don't know that you can use them if you have a, an estimated revenue that you're covering in order to get any kind of credit from them on the on the front side. I don't think so. Uh, maybe James would know the answer to that one. Uh, Roxanne, I think I think that's right. I, I would defer to um, Amanda from from RMA to uh, give the final answer on that. But uh, my understanding is that uh, any payments that you receive during the year are counted as revenue for your farm. But in the next year, um, you are not able to count them as part of your historic revenue. Uh, the reasoning being that you can't really insure uh, government payments. Uh, but uh, Amanda, if you have anything uh, to add, that would be helpful. Okay, so another question, there's a kind of a group of questions about what is covered. So one question was, um, can, uh, what about honeybees? And, and uh, apiculture is covered, and again, it's based on the revenue that you, your historical revenue that you would have got from your um, beekeeping operation. Another person asked about less than an acre of, cover, of land in production. And again, it would be based on your revenue. It's not based on, so if you're growing a high value crop on that one acre and you want to get that uh, covered, um, or even if, you know, uh, I don't know, is there a minimum amount? That can be covered if someone's only earning five thousand dollars from their one acre. Can that be covered under whole farm revenue insurance? Uh, there is not a stated minimum amount uh, that I am aware of. Okay. Another person asked about the sale of raw milk as an allowable agricultural enterprise for insurance. I would guess that if it's legal in their state, that it would be covered. Yeah, that's a question that I may have to um, I may have to defer to uh, either Amanda or Roxanne or, or get back to uh, the participant. I'm I'm not sure how, how that would be covered if if uh, it would be on a state by state basis or not. There was another question if uh, chemical drift was covered as um, a, a reason for loss of revenue and the, the whole farm revenue protection specifically does not allow chemical drift. The loss of revenue due to chemical drift as an approved um, reason for the loss of revenue. If somebody wants to just verify that, but I believe I've read that. Yes, that's correct. Anytime you have an uninsurable cause of loss, the adjuster that goes out there for a claim would have to determine how much loss would come from an uninsurable cause and then how much would come from an insurable cause before they would issue an indemnity check. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, I, I would just add that it, it doesn't cover that, but it's probably to um, uh, organic producers advantage that it doesn't cover it. Um, uh, you probably don't want uh, organic producers being responsible for uh, for you know a chemical drift that uh, results from a neighbor. Um, so it, it doesn't cover it, but it, it, it is something that we should figure out how to cover, but not put that on the organic farmer. Just to okay. add to that, oh, I'm just going to sure. add to that for a second, Harriet. Um, one of the reasons, too, is because somebody else is already liable for that, whether you go back to the co-op or you go back to, you know, whoever, you know, did the spraying, uh, there's somebody else that, that is liable for causing that, uh, that problem out there besides the crop insurance. Okay, there were a couple of questions, um, obviously from very diverse growers. Um, what if someone has up to 60 crops. Um, and this is whole farm revenue. So my guess would be they could choose the top five or so of their main crops and then lump the rest of them together in other crops. Don't, do they have to show the revenue from every crop in one way or another 
when they are ensuring their um, farm production. They will want to just start with the ones that give them the most revenue and then go ahead and, and fill those out. And when they do get down to the smaller crops, especially ones that don't count as their own commodity, they will want to group those together. And that's why they have categories, you know, rather than um, listing each vegetable, they have a category for other vegetables uh, type of thing. So, um, so you don't have to list them all, but you will want to list um, as many as it takes to get you the best premium that you can. So if they were making $100,000, could they choose to only insure the revenue of $60,000 worth of their crops? No, I don't believe so. I believe that they have to insure everything that comes up in tax law. We can't hear you if that's Margaret. Hello? So there was another question. Oh, okay. There was another question about if they feed their crops to, they grow all the crops that they grow are then fed to either beef animals or dairy animals, and so the only thing they're actually getting revenue from is the sale of meat or milk. Would they only have one commodity then? Uh, yes, I mean you're you're uh, covering your revenue, and so uh, your commodity count is based on the the crops or the livestock that your revenue is coming from. So if your only revenue stream is from the sale of of uh, cattle, then then that is uh, just uh, counts as as one uh, commodity. Right, but if they were selling milk and let's say some. Uh some bull calves or raised up some steers that they sold, then they would have two commodities because they would have beef, they could have other livestock products as far as if they were selling, um, say, dairy heifers, and, and then also the milk. So that can be broken up that way. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, there were some questions about I'm, I'm raising pollinator habitat, I'm putting in cover crops. Do these things in any way affect the, uh, the indemnity they might get? Is there, uh, because it has been a problem with multi-peril uh, insurance that the, the dates of planting might be set back due to the termination of uh, spring bring cover crop and that sort of thing, does that affect whole farm revenue insurance in any way? Um, normally, no. If it's not a commodity for resale, uh, you're not going to insure any you know, extra revenue based on that. But the, the beauty of the whole farm revenue product is that you can use other practices or types of crops that typically aren't insurable. So if you were doing a um, double cropping, which we don't typically have in Wisconsin for, for most crops. Um, you can, you know, try to, you know, try to raise two crops in a row and that might be, that'll be insurable here because you're getting a revenue off of them. Okay. There was also a question about does it cover acreage in transition to organic? And uh, the answer is yes. Um, and then also, too, once you become certified as organic, there is a provision to allow up to 30% of the revenue being covered, I believe it's 30%, someone can correct me, um, due to a change in production status. So if you were adding acreage or transitioning to organic and your prices would be higher, uh, after that achievement of organic certification, then you can go up to 30% beyond the historical average of your revenue as long as you can show the reason why um, you want to do that. Can someone verify that for me? Yes, it's actually 35%. But yes, as long as they can give us some sort of proof to, or some sort of proof to the insurance company that this is what's going on in their farm. 
so this is how they're expanding, this is why they're expecting more revenue, then yes, they can go up to 35% higher. Okay, there were a couple of questions about whether the slides will be available to participants. And I just want to say that the webinar in, at, in its entirety will be available on both through a link on both the MOSES website and on the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute website. And I believe we could also put the whole webinar up as a PDF without the uh, the sound, if you wish, so you can look at that. And then someone asked about where did you get that list of the 38 organic crops that had the price selections. And of course, you'll be able to find that in the PDF or in the uh, webinar. But James, do you want to tell her where that was found, the organic price uh, selections? Uh, sure. I mean, it's it's uh, provided through the Risk Management Agency's website. Um, I, I think it probably would just be best to provide uh, a tiny URL um, when uh, we put this uh, webinar online instead of uh, giving out the whole URL here. But it is um, available on the USDA Risk Management Agency's website. And if you want to do maybe a Google search for it now, it will probably come up. Right. And if someone would like us to send out the slides, but I'm not sure. I'll have to talk to my organizer to see if we can do that. But we can make the webinar into a PDF. And then it'll either be up on the website or we'll see if we can send it out to all the attendees. I, I can't make a promise without talking to someone about that. And then another question was, um, how much does the Farm Service Agency know about whole farm revenue protection insurance? And is that where they would go to try to find someone to, to sign up for it? That's a that's a really good question. Um, so, and uh, it's an important distinction to make. So, the Farm Service Agency um, is is an important uh, USDA agency that you want to go to for things like farm numbers. Uh, you want to go there for um, uh, applications for all kinds of Farm Service Agency programs. Um, and you would want to go there if you want to sign up for the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program uh, that we talked about briefly, uh, also known as NAP. Um, but the Farm Service Agency is not where you would go to sign up for Whole Farm Revenue Protection. Um, Whole Farm Revenue Protection is a risk management agency program, which is a separate agency within USDA. And the, the, uh, the program is actually, while administered by USDA, is actually sold by uh, private insurance companies. So you would want to find, um, using uh, the link that was provided in one of these slides, um, you would want to find a uh, private crop insurance agent, um, and then you would purchase the policy through that private crop insurance agent. And then all information about Whole Farm Revenue Protection is on the Risk Management Agency's website, RMA. So yet another arm of the USDA. Uh, there was another question um, about whether whole farm revenue protection would be available to sole proprietors, and I believe the answer to that is yes. Again, it's just based on revenue from the farm, whether it's owned by one person or ten people. It's the entity of the farm and the revenue that it produces. So if I'm wrong, someone should... Okay. Um, another question was... Um, the premium credit is on whole farm revenue protection policy, not on a producer's separate corn revenue multi peril policy. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, you don't get your multi peril policy. It's health reduced or a higher subsidy. That part only comes on the whole farm policy if you also have multi peril on your commodities that can. Okay, I think we have gone through most of the questions. Um, the diversity, uh, you can tell here that it really does um, uh, help diversified farmers in a way that has never been available before and actually rewards farmers for the more diversity that they have. And you could go through the cost estimator and see if you are insuring just three crops at the same amount of coverage and you added two more crops, you can see how your premium will go down for the same dollar amount of coverage by adding 
more diversification to your far farm operation, kind of going along with the old adage that don't, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. So this is Margaret Crome again with the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. Thank you, Harriet, for doing such a great job with uh, questions and answers. Very great co collaborator on this. And uh, thank you to our two presenters, Roxanne Rickson and James Robinson. You both have been just exemplary. Thank you for helping to make something that might feel a little scary to some people very, very clear and making it possible for people to go out and get more information on their own, looking at the links. As Harriet said, we will be posting this webinar on the websites both of MOSES and Michael Fields Agricultural Institute within the next day or so. And Risk Management Agency encourages you to call them up if you have questions and to uh, go out and find a crop insurance agent and they are going to be trained to work with you on it. Roxanne Brixen uh, in Wisconsin has been training crop insurance agents and she herself is available so you can go to the Great American Crop Insurance Company, find her and, and contact her. She's making herself available for, for questions but Risk Management Agency has offices around the country and you can go to their offices and get information uh, calling them up online. Uh, just to remind folks that we will be sending out an evaluation and ask your forbearance. It's quick, short, but very helpful to us to know how this webinar uh, worked for you and if in fact uh, long term we're going to call a few of you and say did you in fact uh, get this insurance and uh, just follow up with you there. Thank you again for taking the time. We're very excited about this important program. We consider it one of the linchpins potentially for a sustainable agriculture, and we're grateful to everybody for your participation. This is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Have a great day.